welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. We're going through the book of Acts, and we're in Acts chapter 9 today, beginning in verse number 1. So open your Bible. Hopefully you have one. You can follow along verse by verse. And uh, let's begin with prayer. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, And Saul, still breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Now, we see from this that the death of Stephen <clears throat> did not quench Saul's hatred for the church or for Jesus Christ. Seeing Christians scatter from Jerusalem wasn't good enough for him either. He wanted every single Christian either dead or in prison. He was determined to wipe out the memory of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 2. It says, and he asked of him letters to the synagogues at Damascus, that if he found any who were of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So we see that Saul was actually willing to travel 130 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus in the hopes of satisfying his hatred against Jesus. And the thing is, he wasn't even sure if there were any Christians there but he was willing to risk it. It was worth the effort, just in case. <clears throat> Verse three, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? That'll put an end to it. Jesus just knocked him off his feet. And you know, Saul thought that he was opposing Christians. He did not know that he was opposing the risen, living Lord Jesus Christ. How a person treats Christians is how they treat Jesus. That's how the Lord sees it. Verse five, and he said, who art thou Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the goats. He says, who are you, Lord? He didn't know who it was, but he knew whoever it was, was the Lord. And what you can do what he just did. And then he revealed himself. He said, I'm Jesus, you're persecuting me. Didn't pull any punches. He confronted Saul with his sin. You know why? to wake him up so that he could be forgiven and so that he would repent. That is why we need to teach the straightforward word of God today and nothing else. That's why I do it and have been doing it for so long and I will continue to do it this way. The straight word of God will accomplish two things. It will encourage you if you're doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord and it will rebuke you and hopefully make you feel guilt if your soul isn't as hard as a rock so that you can repent before it's too late. Verse six, <clears throat> and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So Saul with his face in the dust, humbly asked the Lord Jesus Christ what he wants him to do. Clearly his pride is gone in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the toughest hardcore sinner in the world is, is, is humbled and trembles in the real presence of Jesus Christ. Verse seven, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth and when his eyes were opened, he could see no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Now, Saul, who had nothing but hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ, is now blind and confused. He was blind, and he's gonna stay blind for three days, and that's gonna give him time to reflect 
on his past sins and what he just experienced. Verse 9. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. So Saul, if you can just picture this man, suddenly engulfed in guilt, in fear, and in darkness, and it lasted three solid days. He sat alone in the darkness, wondering what was going to happen to him next, because you know, Jesus didn't give him any assurance of forgiveness. Or healing, for that matter. For all he knows, that room that he's in is going to be his place until the day that he dies, and he doesn't know when that's going to be either. It took something like this to wake Saul up. Because his sin was so ingrained in him. You know, he had been filled with hatred and sinful pride. Sin had permeated every cell in his body. And so the removal of that sin demands something drastic, a holy terror and anguish that also permeates every soul or every cell in his body. And you can bet this does. You know, that does bring up an important lesson for us. The deeper one allows sin to become ingrained in their life, the more painful it will be when God starts to dig it out. It's like a cancer. Verse 10. <clears throat> and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Aeneas. And the Lord said unto him in a vision, Aeneas, what did he say? And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Now, Aeneas receives a direct revelation from God. He's a Christian. Verse 11, here it is. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Now I, I would think that any command probably would have been more appealing to him than go meet up with Saul. And that's the last thing he wanted to do. But you know, sometimes God's will for his people makes them feel extremely uncomfortable and sometimes fearful. Verse 11 and 12. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So Ananias probably thought, well, I guess Saul is praying. That's one good sign. God told me that he's praying. So that might have settled him down a little bit. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many of this man and how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on thy name. In other words, Ananias thinks that he has to fill God in on the facts concerning Saul. Now, apparently, you don't know this, God. Maybe, maybe you are not aware of this, Lord, but this guy's been nothing but trouble for your church. And you've got to fill God in, you know. And that's something. I think it's kind of funny, not funny, funny, but kind of strange how Christians who are going through difficult times often feel that they have to explain the situation to God as if he didn't know what was going on. He knows. Verse 15. <clears throat> Verse 15 says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. In other words, in other words, I know what's going on, Ananias. I, I know what Saul has been doing, but I also know what I'm going to make him do. And Jesus is going to make him do this. Well, I suppose Saul could say no, but he's not crazy, not at this point. But notice how Jesus is calling the shots here. I think that's interesting. And he's not apologizing for it either, and I love that. Jesus chose Saul to be saved. Jesus chose Saul to serve him. 
and Jesus also chose Saul to suffer for him, and he doesn't feel the need to give an explanation for it either. And he owes no one an explanation for anything. As a matter of fact, the sooner we Christians understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign and therefore has a right to allow anything he wants into our life and use us in any way that he sees fit and, and in any situation that he chooses, the sooner we understand that basic fundamental truth about his sovereignty, the better off we're going to be because you're never going to have peace until you recognize that and accept it. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hand on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, who appeared unto thee on the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias refers to Saul as his brother. And that's because he's saved. He overlooks his sinful past. He doesn't bring that up because he is now a Christian. God forgives those who come to Christ, no matter what their past may be. And we as Christians need to forgive them as well. If God accepts people, we need to accept them. Verse 18. And mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received sight forthwith, and he arose and was baptized. He was baptized before he did anything else. As soon as he got his sight, he was baptized. And so this verse, once again, as so often happens in the book of Acts, stresses the importance of water baptism for those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you have not been baptized by immersion, then don't put it off. That is God's command. Verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. So he was baptized before he even ate anything or drank anything. And it had been three days since he had eaten or drank, drank anything. Uh, which just goes to show when a person is serious about Jesus, obeying him becomes more important than things generally considered to be necessities. Verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples who were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Boy, he just swallowed his pride. And instead of condemning Jesus to his fellow Jews, he did a 180 and he started preaching Jesus to them. That took some pride swallowing. Everyone makes mistakes. The important thing is to repent and get on the right track. And that is what Saul did. He started preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, which was also admitting that he had been dead wrong in the past. Dead wrong with terrible consequences too. Like the life of Christians. He swallowed his pride. Because right now Jesus is more important to him than anything. Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and came here with the intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? And so the people were amazed. And it's not the Christians who were amazed because the people who were amazed at the reversal in Saul's life spoke of Christians in the third person. So the unsaved world looked at Saul and said, how can this guy make such a change? 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the very Christ. So Saul had the Jews over there in Damascus fired up and confused too. What is going on with Saul, they must have thought. They didn't understand his radical change in behavior, and they didn't understand his new interpretation of Scripture, which favored Jesus which was the exact opposite of where he had stood before. 23, and after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Well, it, obviously not everyone was impressed, nor were they influenced by Saul's reversal concerning Christ. We get to choose our trouble. 
Rejecting Jesus Christ will bring us plenty of trouble from God on Judgment Day. If you want to choose that, go ahead. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it. You reject Jesus Christ, you've chosen trouble with God on Judgment Day. On the other hand, receiving Christ and living for Him in this fallen world will give us trouble today. It's going to give you trouble today with the lost world. And Saul chose trouble from the world rather than trouble from God. Smart choice. I hope you've made that choice. 23. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their lying in wait became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the governor actually turned Damascus into a military fortress just in order to capture Saul. He is a wanted man. Now you think about this for a second, if you would, please. When Saul persecuted Christians, he was a hero. But now people are trying to kill him. Now th just think about that. Saul did not make the switch because he was bored. He did not make the switch on a whim. Saul does not make that switch unless he is absolutely certain that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the risen Savior, the only way to heaven. He doesn't make that switch because the cost is too high for him personally. I'm telling you, the conversion of the Apostle Paul may be the strongest evidence in favor of Jesus Christ and his resurrection that we have in Scripture. 25. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a basket. Now, Saul had faith in God. There's no question about that, but he also used common sense. Jesus tells Christians that in this world you will have tribulation, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't avoid trouble if you can do it without violating the scripture. Absolutely, do it. 26, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. And so the Christians in Jerusalem, they remember they had suffered an awful lot at the hands of Saul. And so they were suspicious. Maybe he's trying to trick us. That's what they thought. Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord on the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And Barnabas is such a kind person. He always seemed to give people the benefit of the doubt. When others did not trust Saul and he really needed a Christian friend, Barnabas stood by him. Barnabas people sure are nice to have around, aren't they? When you need a friend and you, and you just don't seem to have one, maybe you failed Jesus and, and everybody is shunning you because of that. It's nice to have a Barnabas. Barnabas is more like Jesus than a lot of people. 28. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they, were, they went about to slay him. Now, well, figures. The Grecian Jews didn't agree with Saul, continued to reject Jesus Christ, but they couldn't out-debate or out-reason Saul from the scriptures. So what did they decide to do? They're going to kill Saul. If you can't out-reason him from the Word of God, then kill him. The Grecian Jews were like so many people today who have a truth agenda. What I'm saying is they want something to be true. That's their starting point. This is true. We want this to be true. Therefore, we're going to believe that it's true, and we're going to denounce any scriptural support to the contrary. That is just foolishness. We shouldn't care what truth is. I could not care less what truth is as long as I have truth. You don't want to have a truth agenda or you start twisting the scriptures to keep it. Verse 30. And when the brethren found this out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. So Saul escapes death once again. This time he heads to his hometown. 
verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had rest and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. And, you know, I think Saul's conversion helped the church to uh, enjoy a time of peace, but also the Jews really didn't have time to pick on the Christians at this point because they were they had enough on their plate the way it was. Caligula, the Roman Empire, emperor, I should say, um, was persecuting the Jews big time. He made war with them at this point because he tried to set up his image in the Holy Temple. And of course, they fought that tooth and nail. He didn't like that. So they had their hands full. Verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter was passing throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints who dwelt at Lydda. So now we shift gears here from Saul to Peter in verse 32, at least for a little while. And we see Peter visits a church that Philip had established a while back in Lydda, verse 33. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years and was sick with the palsy. In other words, he was paralyzed and he had no, <clears throat> no hope of ever, of ever walking again. Verse 34, Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise, make thy bed, and he arose immediately. In other words, Peter in essence said, Aeneas, Jesus has healed you, so now act like it. Get up and walk, or the healing won't do you any good. You know, that's good counsel for Christians today too. Jesus has healed us, spiritually speaking. He has taken away our sin, and he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Sin does not have to have dominion over us if we are Christians, so act like it, right? That's what Jesus would say. Act like it. Verse 35. And all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. What an impact his healing had. I mean, after all, no other so-called God could do the things that Jesus was doing through his apostles. Consequently, those who had honest hearts believed the truth of God's word and received Jesus. 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which interpreted mean, Dor means Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Tabitha was a wonderful Christian woman, and there's no record that she ever said great things, but she certainly did a lot of great things. She was a giver. She gave her time and her money to service to the service of her Lord by helping other Christians who had needs. 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper chamber. Of course, death was good news to Tabitha because she's in paradise, she's in heaven, but it was bad news for all those who would miss her. And plenty of people would miss her because women like Tabitha, people like Tabitha, do not grow on trees, obviously, unselfish kind people like this are a very rare commodity in the world today and even in the church. Verse 38, And inasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, entreating him that he should not delay to come to them. See, they're not, they're not willing to give up on Tabitha yet. They're not willing to concede that death has taken her permanently. They call for Peter. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. I think they're trying to convince Peter that he definitely should try to raise her from the dead. I mean, after all, she's a, she's a great woman, very kind, a real servant. And that's why so many people cared about her. You know, the Bible says those who would have friends must show themselves friendly. Pray to God that you can be a blessing to someone today. 40. But Peter put them all outside and kneeled down and prayed. 
And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. I love what Peter does here. There is no showmanship with him at all. He's not like a performer on the Ed Sullivan show. You know, this is not a circus. No showmanship here at all. He wasn't there to draw attention to himself. He puts everybody out of the room. It's just him and the dead body. He was there to let Jesus work through him. And he attempted to do it in the least conspicuous way, and he did. 41. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and calling in the saints and widows, he presented to her, he presented her to them alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. You know, the apostles were just extensions of the Lord Jesus Christ doing miracles in the early church to show that the message of Christianity was authentic. And that's what's going on here. And the result was that many people were coming to Christ in the early church. He said, I wish we could do that today. Well, yeah, I know what you're saying. I wish I could do that too. I wish I could, I just got out of the hospital. And, and it's sad, it's sad. I wish I had the gift of healing like Peter did because I know where I would head to, I'd head right to hospice. And I'd touch every one of those people and, and raise them up and give them back to their families. And there would be so much joy. And I'd preach Jesus and that would be wonderful. But you know, we don't need it in order for people to be saved. Today we have the written word of God, which is truth, and which also contains the miracles that testify to the reality of Jesus Christ. We have the written word of God. It is the anointed, supernatural word of God, and it will burn in the heart of those who are open to truth. And if they are open to truth, they will repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if the word of God doesn't do the trick, doesn't push them over the edge, then Jesus himself said, even, even a miracle won't do the trick. The word of God is that powerful. It is that sufficient. That's why I don't understand why any preacher or any church would do anything other than proclaim the word of God. And that's why I do it from Genesis through Revelation because it's all important. And that's why I do it in a straightforward manner the best that I possibly can. And I would pray that you would want to be a part of this ministry and help me to get out the Word of God. If the Word of God blesses you, all I ask is that you would bless me back. I have no church, large church or denomination underwriting this ministry, never have. And so if you want to be a part of this ministry, you can write me, scripture, verse by verse, post office box, 2211 Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's scripture, verse by verse, post office box, 2211 Wasser, 54402-2211. And if you want to email me with your questions and comments, which are always welcome, you can do that at versebyverse at live.com. That's versebyverse at live.com. And one thing I want to tell you before I leave, don't forget to check out the Scripture Verse by Verse website because anything and everything you need to grow spiritually, you can find there. You can study the entire Bible, any book of the Bible, any chapter of the Bible, any section within that chapter. Study the whole Bible from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible commentary and it won't cost you a cent. Some people charge for their messages, but Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Please stand with this ministry and help me to get out the Word of God and go there. The web address is thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Thanks so much for spending this time with me. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.
Thank you.